Okay, well, we're going to try and finish up chapter 3 of Hebrews tonight. Let's see how far we get. Uh, before we get going, were there any questions that you guys had from either our previous weeks or from your own reading from Hebrews? Okay. So we will start uh, with just a quick little recap. Last week, we started looking at how Jesus is superior to Moses, and we're going to continue that in verse 4. Now, every house is built by someone, but the one who built everything is God. So my dad used to always say this when he when he built houses. People would always say, oh, you know, you build such lovely, lovely houses. And you say, I didn't really build it. I just took what was already there, and I made it into something. And uh, I think that that kind of summarizes what, what's going on in this verse here. Builders take what is already there. However, God gave it. He's the one who actually created the things that we're building the stuff out of. I mean, even take AIs, right? So we're trying to create an artificial intelligence. Uh, basically, what we're trying to do is create new life, is, is what people are trying to do with these AIs. And uh, But what we're doing, we're not bringing something out of existence that didn't exist. We're simply arranging the things that God has created in our own pursuits of creativity. Um, so builders take what is there. God is the one who actually gave it. Every house is built by someone, but the one who built everything is God. Um, and this, how this applies to Moses, obviously, I'm sure you guys are already there, most of you. Uh, but just in case, make sure we're all on the same page. Moses had the tabernacle, but Jesus was the creator. So Moses was the, was, was the steward of the house. He, he had the tabernacle. He's, he was known in Jewish thought as the, you know, the, the guy with the law and the guy with the tabernacle. But Jesus is the, is, the, um, is the creator of all that. So every house is built by someone. House, of course, being kind of a, it was not euphemism, but... Um, um, an idea for for the tabernacle, but the one who built everything is God. So in verse 5, it says this. It says, Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's household as a testimony to what would be said in the future. Um, So Moses served faithfully, but he served in the lesser thing. And the lesser thing that he served in was the tabernacle. And he only, uh, the tabernacle foreshadowed what was coming. It wasn't the reality of what was coming. So, um... You see this a lot in the old in, in the Old Testament, where um, I'm trying to kind of summarize a few thoughts here. Um, let me just say this: the the tabernacle after it was destroyed the last time, um, obviously in 70 A.D., it hasn't been rebuilt yet, and obviously the implication there being, we don't need it to get to God. So. Um, in fact, the Bible actually says that it was the things that happened there were as a um, judgment against um, the people of Israel. So uh, here it says here, as a testimony to what would be said in the future. In the context of Hebrews, said is oftentimes not so much what you say with your mouth. Said is oftentimes more of a way of talking about words and actions. For instance, later in the book of Hebrews, it's going to talk about the way that the blood of Abel spoke. Well, how can somebody's blood speak? See what I mean? Um, and in the, same, in the same idea here, it talks about how Jesus, um, God spoke in these last days through Jesus, but Jesus didn't come as a word. He came as the word in flesh and lived a life and did the miracles. So it involves not just simply speaking, it involves the actions too. Um, when, you get, when we get past this, so you could say in that aspect that Jesus' death spoke. Uh, Hebrews, when we, when we get past that, we get to verse 6, and it says this, But Christ was faithful, so whereas Moses was the steward, Christ was faithful as a son over his household, and we are that household if we hold on to our confidence in the hope in which we boast. So let's kind of break this down. First off, let's look at that first part where it says that Christ was faithful as a son over his household. We have now can compile a, a sort of list of sorts uh, where we can see the different ways that Jesus contrasts to Moses. So Jesus was over the household is what it said there. But in the verse before, it said that Moses was in the household. Uh, it said that it, it, we're talking about the, the tabernacle. Jesus is over the reality in heaven as our mediator. Moses was in the shadow, which was the earthly tabernacle. Something that was, its purpose was to point forward to the greater thing. Uh, and then uh, Jesus was the son. Moses was a servant. If for, for Jesus, it was his household. It says there, but Christ was faithful as a son over his household. Whereas, Mo- whereas Moses wasn't over his own ho- household, he was over God's household. So in every way then, Jesus, Jesus is superior to Moses. 
then also in verse 6, it's, it uses this word, and we are that household if we hold on. And the idea behind this word hold on is basically to keep a tight grip. You are firmly grasping, um, which obviously implies a bit of struggles because you don't have to hold firmly to something if there are no struggles. You, if you, don't, you don't really have to hold on to a kite if there's no wind. It's not going to go anywhere. It's just going to... So you don't really have to hold on tight. So the very fact that verse 6 tells us to hold on, tells us, or t- told the Hebrews to hold on, uh, should be a, a very strong implication that there are going to be struggles. Um, and, and sometimes we come to, this, come to this idea that, hey, even if, then this. So let me say it in a different way. Even if struggles come, Jesus is our anchor. No, 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 no. Because struggles are going to come. Jesus is our anchor. It's not something where um, we can have that choice apart uh, from Christ. Uh, and so then the third thing I want to point out from this, from verse 6, is that he gives us a bit of a condition here. It says, we are that household if we hold on to our confidence. And all the people who grew up watching Disney cartoons are going to say, do you know what you just said? And it, yeah, I said, if. On Cinderella, you guys remember that? Where she's all, uh, she can go to the party and the sisters start throwing a fit and they're all, do you know what you just said, Mom? And the mom's like, yes, I know what I said. I said, if. And then the sisters go, ah, ha, 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 if. Yeah. Well, whatever. I grew up a lot with Disney cartoons, okay? <laughs> Don't judge me. <laughs> Don't judge me. Uh, anyways, uh, so he gives us these two conditions. If we hold on to our confidence and the hope in which we boast. So we can, we can kind of summarize these two conditions uh, by seeing this confidence. Confidence is basically our witness, the way we are uh, uh, living out the gospel, spreading the gospel, telling people about the gospel. That would be the confidence. And then the hope is something that the hope is more personal. It's our hope of the resurrection. We have a hope that we will be resurrected, that Christ was resurrected, that there's a new heavens and a new earth, that there's hope ahead. Um, So when we go back and read that, and we are that household if we hold on to our confidence, so our, our witness, and the hope in which we boast, our, our, um, our inner hope of what is, co- what is to come. So in essence, those two things, our confidence and our hope, can be summarized as the Christian faith. Those two things are basically summarizing if we hold on to our Christian faith. Um, because remember, as, as, as Christians, it's not just about what I believe inside. If Christianity has no expression in our actions uh, in, in our life, there really is no Christianity at all. Uh, we could ask like this. Are we, are, we really, are we really the temple of God? Are we really the house of God? Well, if. So then are we really saved? Can we honestly say that we are saved? Well, yes, but Christians first off show it. A Christian who doesn't show it isn't really a Christian. There has to be some kind of a some kind of a change that happens. I'm not saying that there's a perfection that happens. We are obviously still all still sinners. But there is a, a, a expression of that salvation. Um, James puts it like this. Faith, which does not produce works, is dead. And that's just kind of the idea there. Uh, and then also, Christians are those who don't abandon it. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean simply this. Christians are not those who start the race. Christians are those who finish the race. Now that takes us to a, a kind of a bit of a persnickety area because it sounds like I'm saying something along the lines of this. If you are saved, you'll stick with it. Nobody ever loses their salvation or, or walks away from God. And that's not true. That's definitely not true. So any, rather I'm saying something along the lines of this, that anybody can fall. Anybody. And we need to be aware of that. Um, because if we don't plan for the possibility of our failure, we are leaving an open door for Satan. Sometimes we think, th- some areas in our life we think are um, untouchable. God, uh, Satan can never tempt me in that area. Mine and my wife, ju- me and my wife, we just have such a strong marriage that we will never fall, we'll never mess up. So what happens? We don't put any protection for our marriage at all. And we open the door for Satan to do something because we're not paying attention. We don't pay attention to how we're spending our time, who with. Difficulties come and we start getting distant from our wife. Oh, it's fine because we have an unbreakable marriage. So we, uh, our greatest strength actually becomes the greatest door for Satan to work in our life. Uh, it's one of those things where we really have to be on our guard. Anybody can fall. 
Um, <clears throat> and I think that, that kind of the idea that gets us across is when Jesus tells the parable of the seeds, he says that um, he tells a story about this farmer giving out seeds, and he, he casts some on good soil, and then it grows and it produces, everything's fine. But then he throws some seed on rocky soil, and it starts to grow. This would be uh, the example of someone who genuinely got saved. They had an experience of God. They got saved. They came to the faith. And then they die out. They don't make it. They get choked out and they die. And it gives various reasons for why that happens in Matthew, but I don't really want to get too into that. Uh, My point being that you can genuinely be saved and then genuinely fall away. Um, And the thing is, uh, predestination in our salvation is kind of a two-headed coin in a lot of ways. See, God knows who ultimately is going to fall away and who's going to make it. We don't. But we have a choice today. And Hebrews is obviously talking about our side. He's not, in, in the book of Hebrews, he's not making a case for God to do something. He's making, a, making a, 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 the case for us to do something. In a minute, he's going to quote uh, Psalm, an, a Psalm, uh, Psalm 95, and he's going to say, today is a, is a day of salvation. So let's, let's keep plowing ahead here, okay? Um, well, actually, let's go to it right now. Uh, Psalm. So the idea, if you are saved, you'll stick with it, that is false. That is absolutely false. There's something called the perseverance of the saints. And that's not so much that God's people never fall away, so much as God never falls away from his people. I think that that's a good way of kind of summarizing the perseverance of the saints. But anyways, let's kind of move ahead to, to verses 7 through 8. Now this is a quote from Psalm 95, 7 through 11. Did I put the wrong verses on there? No, I don't think I did. Well, if I did, you'll find out sooner or later. <laughs> Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me, tested me pried me, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked to anger excuse me, with that generation and said, They always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest. So this is um, this is a passage here in, in Psalms, and I, I think it's very interesting because the writer of Hebrews introduces it like this. He doesn't say, therefore, as David says, or as Asaph says, or as the psalmist says. He doesn't say that. He says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says. Um, obviously, the idea that the Holy Spirit inspired Scripture isn't a new one. This is something that goes all the way back <laughs> to, you know, the at least... At least, at latest, the the first first uh, century. So, um, one thing that I think is is kind of um, interesting is a lot of times people think that this verse is talking about being saved, and to a, to an extent, it, it can be referencing that. But primarily, it's not talking about people being saved. It's Christian. It's talking about Christians, God's people, who become hardened by sin. You always hear this verse talked about for outsiders, for, for, for people who, who didn't, uh, who haven't been saved. But you never hear it talked about with Christians. Hebrews is, is interested primarily not with the world, but with the church and them returning from their Christianity to their Judaism, going backwards on the journey instead of forwards. In fact, you could even summarize the entire book of Hebrews by just saying, don't go backwards. Uh, and and so here in here in Hebrews, he's talking about an audience that is being threatened to go backwards. They have a heart problem. They have an attitude problem. And there's a lot of times uh, in church where we don't really emphasize how we need to grow. We emphasize how our culture is evil and wrong. And I think that obviously we need to have a firm grasp of about what the Bible says about lots of different things. You know, not just homosexuality, but lots of things that our culture does wrong, like abortion and those kinds of things. We do need to have an idea of what the Bible says about that. However, I think that it's important to notice how many times the Bible talks to Christians and says, these things, y'all need to change. Not the world needs to change. And I think there's just a big big focus difference there. So uh, there, there's this idea in our culture. I, I know atheists have it. I know sometimes even Christians have it. Um where it, it, they say something along the lines of this, maybe not these exact words, but something very closely. If God would only do this, whatever this is, then I would 
believe, or then they would believe. This atheist doesn't believe because God hasn't done this. Well, I'm having troubles in my faith because I'm praying and God's not answering me. If God would just do this, then I would believe. Then my faith would be strengthened, then so on and so forth. But that's really not the case. Um, You find in the Bible over and over again that those who need signs and wonders from God always need signs and wonders from God. Let's take, for instance, a couple examples. Jesus is over here doing a bunch of miracles and they come to him and say, give us a sign. What what do you want? What, What more do you want? You know, and then he's raised from the dead. It's not enough. All the, he presents himself to his, to his disciples and, and who a lot became the apostles. That's not good enough either. They still need more. So then you, you, can, you can really go through a lot. Here's another example. In the book of Judges, there's, there's one of the judges, his name's Gideon. And God appears to him in an angel. And an angel appears before him and calls him a mighty man of God as he's hiding in, a, in, a, in, in, in the... <laughs> in the place where they thresh the grain. Uh, he, he's hiding there, and he calls him a mighty man of God. This guy doesn't even serve God alone, and he's got bitterness towards God, and the angel calls him a mighty man of God. <laughs> you got to appreciate the irony. So he, he, he says, okay, all right, well, that's not good enough for me either. I also need this, I'm going to put this outside, and there's going to be dew on it, and the ground's going to be dry. And then the next night, that's not good enough. Now he needs another sign. Okay, now the ground's going to be wet, and this is going to be dry, or the fleece, or whatever it's called. And it's like you, you see him time and time again need more and more signs from God. And that's kind of the image you see from God. People who doubt God when he says something, they always need more to validate themselves. And so that takes us to two things. There's two applications from this whole section here about today if you hear his voice, today if you hear his voice. The first thing is more of a quality issue. As a Christian, you can live your life in misery and not enjoy peace, you can be bound in sin and bitterness without losing your salvation. It can happen. I've seen numerous times people do this. However, you can't stay there for very long. <laughs> Eventually, you're going to fully degrade or you're going to let God change your heart. The problem is, is that people, people will get into this kind of a situation for 40 years or so, and then they feel kind of, God can't change me. They just, And then you start to get into an area of disbelief. But well, let's Put a pin in that. We'll come back to that. And the thing is, when you allow yourself to have this, um, to, to, to miss out on God's rest in your life, you miss out all the good things that he had for you, all the ministry opportunities he had for you, all the, all the opportunities he had to change your heart, to show you new things you haven't seen, to teach you new things, to, to impact another person's life. You miss all that because you're stuck in bitterness. And you, you miss the whole thing. And he's saying the exact same thing as he said 2,000 years ago. Today, if you hear my voice... And we just, eh, I'll worry about it tomorrow. Then the second application from from Psalm 95, from this quote here in in verses 7 through, uh, what was it, 8 or 11, or I think it was 11. Uh, The second application is the loss of Christian life, the the loss of your salvation. Um, Obviously, uh, there's there's an idea, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, the whole once saved, always saved. I've already kind of mentioned it, going to mention it again. Can you lose your salvation? Uh, It's a yes and a no. Um, you can give your salvation away, but you can't like lose it. Let me explain the difference. Losing it is like, oh, what happened here? Oh. Uh, giving it away is I'm going to disobey God continually. I'm going to live my life my own way. And then when I continually get harder and harder in my heart, uh, I'm going to eventually reach a place of just walking away from my own free will. And uh, obviously there's a difference between Christians walking away from their salvation and the world becoming hardened. Those are two different areas. But in Hebrews, we're talking specifically about Christians becoming hardened. Were you about to ask something? Right. So that is, that's the view that I was talking about, about um, uh, once saved, always saved. The reason why I don't believe that view is because of Hebrews. He's going to talk about here in chapter six, he's going to say, for those who have tasted of the spirit and have walked away, it is impossible to renew them to Christ. In other words, they were with Christ, they abandoned Christ, and you can't renew them to that. And we're going to talk about what does that mean. Is that an unforgivable sin? We'll look at that when we get there. But um, that's why I don't believe that. I think people can genuinely be saved and then walk away from that. Um, Obviously, the Baptist uh, denomination strongly disagrees with that. Uh, Baptist churches do teach once saved, always saved. And so if somebody walked away from the faith, it's because they were never saved in the first place. But obviously, then you have a whole problem with Hebrews 
and you're going to have to rectify that somewhere. Like, you have to answer, okay, so why is the Hebrews even written? <laughs> if Christians who are truly saved cannot walk away from that, they can't go backwards, they can't leave the faith, then why was Hebrews ever even written? Like, what? The whole point of the book is to get Christians not to walk away from the faith. And uh, so I, I don't see any convincing. I have yet, I've read a lot of books about this, and I have yet to read one that convinced me that Hebrews is some of them said this. They said, Hebrews is talking about something that couldn't actually happen. So then why why bother with it? Like, if you're going to fall away and it's nothing I can do about it because you're not really saved, then oh, tough. See what I mean? Now, I, now I, there's, no, there's no burden on me to even evangelize now because ultimately somebody's going to be saved. They're going to be saved. They don't need me to tell them about the gospel. See what I mean? And that takes us to a whole slippery slope argument. <laughs> and I just don't see any, any basis for that in Hebrews. But I, I am very glad that you brought it up, though. Um, did I answer that? Yeah, okay, all right. Where am I? Here, okay, so then there are two things that I feel like I really need to specify. And I'm going to use my own words. Because the Bible doesn't use it like this. It says the idea, but it doesn't use these words. And I'm using these words to help you understand what I'm trying to communicate, okay? So there's a difference between a doubt and a disbelief. And once again, these are my own words. So the Bible might say, you know, don't doubt, and it's talking about a different concept than I'm talking about, okay? When I say doubt, I'm talking about a struggle of your faith. This is something where you come to a point of your, your faith is being tested. You're having to lean more into the promises of God than you did yesterday. Uh, you get into a new situation in your life, a new, new, new uh, turn in the road, you might say, and it's tested the faith that you had of yesterday, and you have to grow to meet the new challenge. What happens in that meantime is we go through a period of doubting. And what I mean by doubting is our emotions, my emotions, our emotions go back and forth. It's not necessarily that we walk away from the faith, it's that we feel dead inside emotionally we feel lost. We feel like God's a million miles away. Uh, we don't get anything from our Bible studies or from our prayer. We just go through this place of kind of just not feeling it, just being depressed. There, there's God just not hearing me in this. That, that. I, I'm calling that doubt. And every Christian goes through that. You're going to have struggles in your faith. Your faith is not perfect. It never will be. You're going to go through times of testing in your faith. This is how you build endurance. It's how God grows your faith. Then I'm going to call this other thing disbelief. Disbelief is the end of the journey. You went through a time of doubting, and instead of the doubting can take years, but at the end of that period of doubting, did you lean more into God's promises, or did you pull back and, and, and not believe what he said in his word? And when you lean back and you start getting into sin and bitterness and hard-heartedness, you know, God, God doesn't care. God, God doesn't care. Uh, my mom struggled with this her whole life. When she was a kid... Um, she prayed for her great-grandpa to be healed. He had brain tumors. And get this. <laughs> he had two different kinds of cancers, and one of the cancers was healed only for the other one to kill him. And she always said, why did God do that? I don't know. <laughs> why did God give my mom the new liver and then still kill her from a heart attack? Like, I don't know why God does these things. <laughs> I have no clue. If I did, I would give you an answer, but I don't. God, you know, has his own thing. But my point being, my mom struggled with that her whole life. What Did she lose her salvation? No, she didn't lose her salvation. She struggled with it her whole life. This is the difference. In disbelief, there's no longer a struggle. In disbelief, you have come to the conclusion, God doesn't care. His promises are not true. It's not about your emotions going back and forth. It's about you have landed on an answer, and the answer is God is lacking. Disbelief is the end of the journey. These are the different things, and this is the end of it. So it, 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 disbelief is the end of a process. You could say it like that. It's when you start holding on to sin. You start holding on to pleasure. I remember there's a time in my life, I'd, go, I'd gone through so much hurt that I finally reached a point that I said, I'm, and, I, and I didn't even realize that I did this, but there was a conscious choice in me where I said this, I'm going to live my life for more pleasure. I take my life too seriously. I just need to enjoy it more. And it seemed harmless at the time. I'd gone, you go through a lot of hurt. But then you start noticing that you start making all these choices where your choices are all about you. You know, it's not about God. It's not about the kingdom. You're not worried about people getting saved. You're worried about, am I comfortable with this? And it takes you to a whole other level. 
Uh, let's see what else. Uh, so you're continually choosing not to trust and obey God. Um, I Once again, I always think of that hymnal song, Trust and Obey if There's No Other Way. Trust and obey. It just comes back to it over and over and over again. It's not about how you feel in your faith. You're going to have times of doubt. You're going to have times when you just don't feel it. These seasons can last for months and years. That is normal. It's a part of your growth. I'm sure that Paul didn't always feel super into it when he was being stoned or shipwrecked or imprisoned. I'm sure he didn't always wake up and say, hurry for me. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's a normal part of, of what's going on. Even Jesus, the night of his, of his betrayal, is, is weeping in, in the, uh, or I should say sweating blood in the, um, in the garden uh, on the Mount of Olives, uh, you know, in, in, in anticipation of what he had to deal with. So I think that this is something that, you know, we should not try and make it super spiritual. Yes, you are going to have these times of struggles in your faith. When they come, don't lose heart. Ride the storm. You're not going to feel like it, but just keep holding on. Give it time. It takes years sometimes, but keep holding on. Don't give up. There are three stages of sin that will inevitably come to Christians, not to the world. The world, they're already living in sin, so there isn't this process. Okay. Um, so the three stages of sin that come on Christians, the first step is the fight against conscience. This is where you know that something's wrong. You know that it's wrong, and you do it anyways. Why? Because it feels good. Christians sin because it feels good. The world sins because they're stuck in it. They're sinners. That's what they do. They can't, can't escape. Christians sin because they like it. Uh, and so there's they, this fight against conscience. That lasts for uh, different, different lengths of time. It matters. How, it depends how much you get into it. Um, and sometimes things, things feel good in the moment, but then they leave you with a lot of regret. I was talking with one, one woman, and she was talking about the way that she um, cheated on her husband, and you know it felt so good at the time. And then afterwards, she had to live with this regret, and then she got pregnant from that other guy. So things really got complicated. Uh, and then when her husband found out, he, there was a divorce there. Then in trying to rectify the marriage, she decided to involve her best friend and have a... Um, group encounter, if you know what I'm saying. And it just went from bad to worse. I mean, this thing, it just fell apart. And this, is, this, this, took, this took the span of, uh, of years. And uh, she would put herself in a constant state of, 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 gr of grief and guilt, but then she wouldn't make new choices. So the first is fight against conscience. Then there's a seeking to justify. After you fought with your constant conscience, it's not that you're, that you're numb inside yet. You get numb. In fact, you should be concerned when God stops impressing on your heart about stuff. That's a big red flag. But um, it, it's, it's not that you stop feeling at this point. It's that you want to do what you want to do. And so you're trying to justify. It's not really wrong that I'm doing this. It, it's not really that bad. I mean, other people are doing a lot worse things than me. There's people out there trafficking children. Well, we're not really talking about them, though. We're talking about you. And once you get into this area, it kind of kind of starts to you feel yourself kind of change inside, and you get a real bad attitude, and your relationships start to kind of get shot. And you get to the third stage, living boldly. This is where you just this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. And I talked about this a couple Sundays ago, where the sin starts to define you. It's no longer I'm struggling with homosexuality. It's I am a homosexual. I was born this way. I'll stay this way. This is who I am. Your sin has now defined you. It's who you are. And so to attack the sin is an attack on your own person, your own character. Uh, and there's this whole, you, you can't say anything against, against this. There's this choice that I'm making because it's not wrong. I'm going to do these drugs, and that's just who it is. It's not that big of a deal. I'm not hurting anybody else. Another one I hear quite frequently from, from men, uh, looking at this porn, doesn't, it doesn't hurt my marriage. I mean, it, it, I can do this, and it's not hurting anybody. It's something I do by myself except it does hurt them, and it does cause the marriage distress, and the women who are recorded in those videos are very much so trafficked and mistreated. So yes, it is, it is not a harmless crime. So it's, you, know, you get to the stage of living boldly. And the thing that we can get from all of this is that inevitably, actions affect behavior. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, actions affect beliefs. And likewise, beliefs affect actions. So let me kind of break that down. How do actions affect beliefs? Well, you start sinning, and then you accept the sin. I've seen a lot of people do this. Th this is one of those harmless Christian sins that we, we like to pretend it's totally fine to do. Gossip, right? Well, I'm going to start gossiping about this person, and then you get a bad attitude. 
and then that bad attitude spreads. And people are always surprised that the bad attitude spreads. I'm not mad at this person. I'm mad at this person. Yes, but sin doesn't stay put. <laughs> Bitterness doesn't stay put. You gossip about one person, it's going to spread. If somebody's gossiping to you, watch out. They're going to gossip about you. It's, give it a little bit of time. It's going to happen. Oh, no, we're best friends. <laughs> oh, no. You can always bank that people will act according to how they act. There was this guy that I was friends with, and he changed out wives and friends quite frequently. He got mad at them all the time, and he would, he would change them out. I get, got tired of this wife, so I got another wife, got tired of her, got another wife. And I told myself, I said, he's not going to do that to me. We're buddies. Well, guess who he did it to? <laughs> it, didn't, it took a while. It took about 12 years, but eventually he did it. Why? Because you can always trust. Pirates of the Caribbean puts it like this. You can always trust a dishonest person to be dishonest. Honestly, it's the honest people you have to watch out for because you never know when they're going to be dishonest. And that is surprisingly intelligent for a drunky, drunken pirate. That yes, you can trust people to do according to their nature. Um, I, for instance, have, not, have never abandoned a ministry post. I've never left when the going got, got hard. I have no intention of starting now. You can look at my history and say, okay, even if we treat this guy like crap, he's going to write it out. That's, that's, <laughs> you can look at my past and know that. You see what I mean? But then at the same time, you can also look at things in your own life and say, okay, how, what, what do I need to work on here? So if our actions affect our beliefs, and also vice versa. Our beliefs affect our actions. And how, how this works is we, we start thinking in our heads something like this. It's not really wrong because blank. So we start thinking that. So because we're believing that, now we're going to act on that. From the outcome of our heart, you know, it goes that way. So just a few more things that we need to, need to kind of throw out here. It says in uh, verse... Mm, I want to say it's around 10. Yeah, somewhere around there. They always go astray in their hearts. And if you notice, he says astray in their hearts. This is not talking about messing up. Everybody's going to mess up. He's not talking about you lose your salvation every single time that you sin. You don't have to go up, to the, go up for altar call every Sunday. Okay, That's not what we're talking about. He's talking about astray in their hearts. He's talking about Christians living in sin, choosing sin. You re read through Exodus and Numbers and look to see what Israel did. They saw, they messed up a couple times, but then they, they, they made conscious choices to oppose God. It says they complained against God. They complained against Moses. They kept going and they kept going and kept going and it got worse and worse. God kept punishing them more and more until finally they get to the deciding moment. And you know exactly what they're going to choose to do because of the choices they've been making in the past 10-ish chapters. God says, go to the promised land, and they say, we're good. We're good. See, the time came to enter the rest, and they missed it because of the choices that they'd been making. And this is the exact same thing that happens to us today. We start getting blindsided because we start letting sin in a little bit at a little bit. Just a little bit. A little bit more, a little bit more. And then we're surprised that when the time comes for the test, we fail because we haven't been preparing for the test. We've been preparing for our happiness. And that's, that's, that's where it all ended. So uh, obviously this takes us to a place of not surrendering to God, and this is, this is a hard issue. So the summary of what we've looked at in, in Hebrews. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please write them down, and we'll start off next week with the questions section, and we'll look right at it, okay? Uh, the summary we looked at, real basic here, verses 1 through 6, Jesus is greater than Moses. Um, and then verses 7 through 11, don't get a hard heart. And, uh, yeah, that's a pretty, pretty simple uh, summary. I think, yeah, pretty good.